Okay. You know, there's very few speakers we have back frequently. And it's not because all of them aren't great speakers, but you tend to get uh, responses from the men saying, boy, if we can ever bring him back. In fact, sometimes you get them and say, let's bring him back every year. <laughs> well, no, we're looking for a little more diversity than that. But when we first had Devin Schott speak, and I think it's been a few years ago anyway. Time flies when you're confused. Uh, <laughs> Devin came, and I tell you, if you're not familiar with his ministry to fathers, there is something you can learn and grow and just be enormously best blessed by. He's got a lot of materials out here. I'll let him do that. But uh, he's the executive director of the Fathers of St. Joseph. It's an apostolate that is committed to restoring, redeeming, and revitalizing fatherhood. So pretty apropos for us today. He's the author of Joseph's Way, 80 Days to Unlocking Your Power as a Father. He has got a ton of materials out there for you to uh, peruse and to purchase. I, I don't think, and I've heard a lot of talks as I go around talking around the country, there are very few men who speak as not only eloquently, but to the heart of fatherhood than Devin Schott. So please welcome our good friend and returning speaker, Devin Schott. Testing, testing. Okay, all right. All right. This pulpit I can actually see over, so this is great. <laughs> okay, let's invoke our patron, St. Joseph. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Joseph, terror of demons. St. Joseph, glory of home life. St. Joseph, pillar of families. St. Joseph, guardian of virgins. St. Joseph, exemplar of all fathers. Holy Mary, good St. Joseph, our parents in the order of grace, obtain for us the great gift of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus may be conceived in us, ever anew, ever more, more fully. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we begin, I need to confess that I do not relish giving talks. I actually don't like it at all, and there's a reason. There's two reasons. The first is that I believe that talks are like a monologue. I'm talking at you. And I don't know about you, but I don't like to be talked at. You know, I like conversations. So the second thing is that I don't know your struggles. I don't know your sufferings. I don't know your situa situation. I don't know what has brought you here today and what your life is like. So I can't speak to that, really. And the other thing is, is that if I knew your situation, if I knew your struggles, if I knew your sufferings, I'm not an expert. And so I can't solve them. Okay? So my goal today is nothing more than to bring you hope. I can't solve your problems, but God willing, I can bring you hope. It reminds me of my friend. He's a priest. And after Mass, someone came up to him and said, Father, that was a great homily. He said, oh, it was the Holy Spirit. And the guy said to him, Father, it wasn't that good. <laughs> we don't want that effect here today, do we? So what I'm going to ask you to do during this talk, while I'm talking, as I'm talking, I would like you to pray to God and ask Him for that one thing that you need to do in your life today, that you need to begin implementing in your life today and tomorrow, that one little thing that will begin to set the trajectory for you to become a man of greatness. Because I don't know about you, but I listen to a lot of talks. And I rarely remember what's in those talks. But I remember the resolutions I make. And so make a resolution today, okay? And so my purpose is I'm just bringing Jesus. It's like my friend who gave me uh, a picture painting, The Flight to Egypt. Have you ever, ever seen this painting, The Flight to Egypt? Joseph is leading the donkey that's carrying Mary and Jesus. And I do weird things like this, but one time I was meditating on the painting, and I was like, Lord, who am I in this painting? Am I Mary, who gets to hold Jesus and adore him? Or am I, you know, Jesus, who's protected under the motherly mantle of Mary? 
Or my Joseph leading my family through this valley of tears, you know, to protect them in this land of exile. And immediately the words came in, no, Devin, you're the ass. <laughs> I'm the ass that's bringing Jesus to you today. And as one bishop said to a bunch of seminaries and priests, he says, God uses asses because that's all he has to work with. <laughs> so welcome to our world. Okay, well, I'm glad you're laughing now because we're going to talk about, actually, they asked me to talk about fatherhood in America. It's a serious subject, and I'm going to build a little bit on what Tyler said. The only thing better than going after Tyler is not having to go after Jim Caviezel. So, here we go. So, I want to paint the picture of fatherhood in America briefly with some stats. There are 334 million American citizens. 19% of those, 64 million, are fathers. Of those fathers, there are 18.4 million children, one in four, who do not live with some kind of father, an adopted father, a foster father, or their biological father. Among those children, there are nearly 50% who do not live with their biological father. 50% of our children today will experience their parents' divorce in their lifetime. So what this means, these stats tell us, is that a generation or two generations out, that number of one-fourth of our children not growing up with some kind of a father, a foster father, adopted father, a biological father, will be one half. And children growing up without their biological father will be three-quarters or two-thirds. That's where we're going. And what does this tell us? that there is a famine of fatherhood. There is a crisis of fatherhood. There's a massive absence of fatherhood. John Paul II said in Familius Consortio, that's the role of the family in the modern world. He said in, in Familius Consortio 25, efforts must be made to restore socially the conviction that the place and the task of the father is in the family is of unique and irreplaceable importance. As experience teaches, the absence of a father causes psychological and moral imbalance and notable difficulties in family relationships. And isn't our world imbalanced? It's morally imbalanced. It's psychologically imbalanced. Look at what's happening with transgenderism. Look what's happening with homosexuality and homosexual marriage, etc. Our world is out of control. It's unbalanced. And I believe that it stems from the famine of fatherhood. But the situation is more dire than this. Of those 334 million citizens in America, 21% of those are Catholic, 70 million. Of those 70 million, 39 million, or 39%, 27 million attend Mass weekly. In 1955, it was 75%. Now get this. The church attendance is 61% female, 39% male, which means on any Sunday in the United States of America, only 10 million Catholic men are attending Mass. And let's go a little further than this. Stats say that only one-third of devoted Catholic men pray daily. That's 3.3 million men in America are Catholic who go to Mass weekly who pray daily. That's like the Navy. Did you know that's less than 1% of the 334 million? And one fourth of that less than 1% are fathers. These are the Catholic Navy SEALs. These are the only guys who are really, really ready for battle. And what this tells us, the second takeaway, is that we're vastly outnumbered. And we know in war, numbers win. But the situation is even more dire than this. The father who has authority, and that's right, he has authority, God-given authority over his wife and children. He's been anointed with the power to be a distributor of God's manifold grace, as 2 Peter tells us. But he must be in the state of grace to distribute grace. Because he's, if he's in the state of mortal sin, what does he distribute? Evil. Even unaware. He distributes evil to his family. So how many men in the United States are consistently in the state of grace? Well, if you believe the stats, men between the ages of 18 and 30, almost 80% use pornography regularly. 
men between the age of 31 and 50, almost 70% of men use pornography regularly. Ages 51 and over, over half use pornography regularly. What's the takeaway? The male population in America are mostly boys trapped in men's bodies. We're stuck in the quicksand of mortal sin. We've incapacitated ourselves. We've rendered ourselves incapable of being distributors of God's manifold grace. And if you don't believe that grace is the way that this world operates, look at the world around you because it's a disgrace. We are lacking grace. And our fathers are transferring evil. But just how powerful is fatherhood? 90% of youths in prisons come from fatherless homes. Children from fatherless homes are 32 times more likely to commit suicide, or 32 times more likely to run away from home, and six times more likely to commit suicide. Two times the children, children who live from fatherless homes, are two times more likely to drop out of high school, suffer from obesity and depression and anxiety. Dads have twice as much influence as mom in helping their teens stave off premarital sex. Children from two-parent households with a strained relationship with their father are 68% more likely to be involved in drugs and alcohol and crime. Children from female-headed homes where there is no dad, they have a poverty rate of almost 50%. Children with fathers are 70% more likely not to drop out of school. And this is the clincher. If the mother is the first to convert to Christianity, there's a 17, 1-7% chance that the family will follow. But if the father is the first to convert to Christianity, there's a 93% chance that the family will follow. That's a huge discrepancy. And what does that say? The last takeaway is this, that the human father is essential. He's fundamental to the transformation of the church of his family, and of this world. He's essential. He's not just an afterthought. These statistics testify to an incredible truth. We've been anointed and appointed by God with the divine power to change this world. God the Father needs you to be a great father because our children, our wives, and our world need the greatest father, God the Father. I believe that society goes by way of the family, and the family goes by way of the father. And if you want to change the world, and if I want to change the world, we fathers must change. Because I, if I believe, if the world is to be converted, the church must be renewed, and the church is in desperate need of renewal, isn't it? And if the church is to be renewed, the microchurch of the family, the domestic church, that icon of the Trinity must be restored to being that image of the Trinity's self-giving love. And if that is to happen, marriage must be revitalized to reflect the marriage between Christ and his church. And if that is to happen, the man who is husband, who is father, who is leader, he must become like St. Joseph, a father on earth, like the father in heaven. And that's God's plan. But the real issue at hand is this. Most of us, our fathers, who have, who have wounded fathers, and those fathers wounded us. Most of us are wounded sons who have become fathers who wound their sons. It's like the Little League baseball coach. You ever have a baseball coach who never played baseball? I have. It was a mess. You didn't learn anything about baseball, and you lost a lot of games. <laughs> and that's kind of what we have right now. We have a lot of fathers who were never taught to father, and they're raising their sons to not be fathers. And it's like in the parable of the Good Samaritan, you know? You see that guy laying half dead on the side of the road, and there's Levites, and there's priests who walk by. And you know what? We're like that guy half dead on the side of the road. We've been beaten. The crap has been beaten out of us by Satan and by the world, and by radical feminism, shaming us for ma our masculine authority, shaming us for our patriarchy, shaming us for our role and responsibility to be husbands and exercise that headship. And so what happens? Effeminate leaders, they walk past us and they won't touch us because they don't want to get near that idea that men have authority. And people are ashamed of our masculine authority. But it's time for us to no longer be ashamed, but to take up our role and responsibility as men. As James Stenson says in his book, Successful Fathers, he says that most men, unfortunately, do not succeed in the venture of fatherhood. 
In the task of child raising, as in professional life, no one sets out to be a failure. Falling short in this all-important responsibility seems to come mostly through unwitting neglect. In my experience, many fathers today are unaware that there is a problem, that without intending it at all, they are failing to exercise the moral leadership that their families need. So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly discuss three things, and I can't get into everything. I've written like 21 books on this and done videos and all sorts of stuff. I'm just going to give you the tip of the iceberg. But today I'm going to talk about three things. What, fa what a father really is, what his mission really is, and practical ways, very practical, not a lot, how to fulfill this mission. So what is the father's mission? He is to be an icon of God the Father. We all know what an icon is, right? It's a beautiful painting that you look at, and when you look at it, you, you meditate on it, and you, it's a window to heaven. It's a window to God. We are called to be icons of God the Father. People, when they see us, they should see God the Father in us. John Paul II said in Familiar's Consortium, Article 25, he says the human father's mission is to reveal and to reflect the fatherhood of God. That's huge. That's huge. That means that we're called to reflect God's mercy, his generosity, his power, his creativity, his discipline, his call to perfection, all of that to our wives, to our children, to our friends, and to this world. And anyone who's ever attempted to be a good father knows how serious this calling is and knows the pressure that's involved in it. I believe that's one of the most difficult jobs in the world to be a great father. Because what's at stake? You're not just going out and earning a buck. You're not just going out and winning the day at work. Eternal souls are on the line. That's why fatherhood is so difficult. That's why it's so challenging. God's plan for salvation is related in the scriptures. In fact, God spoke through the prophet Malachi. And he said, in the end, before that great and terrible day, I will turn the hearts of fathers toward their children and the hearts of children toward their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a curse. What's God's game plan? He wants to turn the hearts of fathers, their gaze, their love, their attention, their desire to actually choose their children so their children will feel the trust and the love and the confidence of their earthly father so that they will trust God's, God the Father, so they will believe that God the Father loves them. And that's why I believe that there are so many of us who don't believe that God really loves us, that God has really chosen us, that God desires us, because we didn't get it from dad. But this is God's game plan. And in fact, it's repeated almost verbatim in the New Testament when the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and says about John the Baptist, he will turn the hearts of fathers toward their children. And not only that, Jesus' first two miracles that inaugurated his public ministry, the first was at a wedding, at wedding, King of Galilee, where he transformed the water into wine. And what is that? He's healing marriage. He's sacramentalizing marriage to make it efficacious, grace, grace transmitting. But you know what the second miracle was? A father who has a possessed son. And he pleads with Jesus and he says, if you can, will you heal us? Will you help us? Notice the we. He doesn't say, will you help him? He's possessed. Will you help him? He's sick. No, will you help us? Because this is my son. He's mine, and I care for him. We are one. And Jesus heals the rupture that the devil caused between that son and that father and heals the family. And that's what Jesus wants to do in our families. This is God's game plan, folks. You are at the center of it. You, the human father. And I'm telling you, when a father li really lives out his vocation, heroically, great things happen. Louis Martin, he's now canonized a saint. He had nine children. Four of them died. The five that lived became cloistered nuns. And one of those was little St. Therese. And little St. Therese said that I'm not like the great saints. I'm nothing but a piece of sand compared to the great saints who are like mountains. I can't even sit up in the, without leaning my back to the chair without toppling over. I can't offer the huge sacrifice they offer. But I believe that I'm called to be a great saint. I believe that God the Papa loves me. And here she is. This little girl joins a convent at 15 years old, dies at 24 with tuberculosis. No one knows about her. And she becomes a doctor of the church. 
How could she even believe that God would make her a saint? How could she believe that God was going to make her a doctor of the church, which she did believe? It's because she knew she had the love of her earthly father, and that conditioned her to know that she had the love of God the Father. Competent fathers raise confident children. So, who is the real man? I'm going to give you the three stages of manhood, and this is going to be super profound, okay? There's the boy, there's the man, and there's a spiritual father. Okay, there it is. Woo, all right. The boy, he's symbolized by the bike with training wheels, okay? He'll do anything so that he avoids getting hurt. He doesn't want to scrape his knees, doesn't want to scrape his elbows, and he has everybody waiting on him. He's dependent on everyone. No one's dependent on him. That's why he needs the training wheels, because he has to be held up, and he's not going to injure himself by any means. Then you get the man. The man is symbolized by the ATV, the four-wheeler. And the man knows something that the boy doesn't. He learns a little secret, and that if he suffers just a little bit, if he sacrifices just a little bit, he can get what he wants. So he goes to school. He studies hard so he can get into university. He works hard at university so he can get a great job. He works hard at his job so he can get a promotion, so he can get more money, so he can pay off that car loan or that rent or whatever. He brushes his teeth so he can kiss women. You know, whatever it is, he's, he's suffering a little bit so that he can get something. But notice, he's only suffering for himself so that he can benefit from it. And that's why he's symbolized by the ATV, the four-wheeler, because he's having fun and there's no room for anybody else to ride. But then there's a spiritual father. And the spiritual father is symbolized by the 53-foot semi, you know, the semi with a trailer. And he knows something that the boy doesn't. He's exactly the opposite of the boy. Instead of not being willing to get hurt, He's willing to suffer. He's willing to sacrifice. He's willing to sweat blood and tears in order to provide temporarily for people, in order to save souls. And he will, he will encounter suffering and, and sacrifice in order to accomplish that, that goal. And that's why he's symbolized by the 53-foot trailer, because his goal is to haul souls, souls to heaven. That's what the real man does, the spiritual father. He will die to himself to get souls to heaven. Now guys, all men suffer. Few men sacrifice. Is there a guy in this room who hasn't suffered? Raise your hand, please. There's not a one. Now if I said, how many of you guys sacrifice on a regular basis? I bet I'd start seeing some hands, but I probably wouldn't. If I said, do all of you guys sacrifice on a regular basis? I probably wouldn't see very many hands. You see, all men suffer, few men sacrifice. What's the difference? We're all going to encounter suffering in our lives. But the key is, what do you do with it? Do you complain about it? Do you boast about it? Oh, I'm going through this huge thing. My life's so bad. Do you complain about it? You know what the real man does? He takes that suffering, he embraces it, And he uses that as a tool, a weapon. In fact, he offers that to God as his prayer and says, Lord, this is my prayer for this person, that person, this person who's suffering from a drug addiction, this person who's suffering from anorexia, my wife who's got all these problems. I offer this to you as my prayer. And now what he prays has massive meaning. He means what he prays, and he prays what he means because he's turning his suffering into sacrifice. And did you know... Sacrifice, the Latin word sacrificium, comes from the two Latin words sacer and facere. Sacer means sacred. Facere means to make. And so do you know what sacrifice means? It means you're making something sacred. You're taking it and you're setting it aside for God. You're saying, this isn't mine any longer. I'm giving this to you. And that's what we're called to do with our sufferings. I never trust a man who hasn't sacrificed. There are lots of guys who don't sacrifice. You know, the typical you know, adult who's living in his parents' basement and he's, he thinks he's going to be a professional video gamer. I wouldn't trust that guy, right? But I, do, I would trust the guys that have fought for our freedom on Normandy Beach. I would trust the guy, that Knights of Columbus dad, who when his mentally handicapped son fell in a well, he got in there to lift him out to save his life and in the process dying. Those are the guys that I trust. 
Those are the guys I would confide my life to. You will suffer. But will you be a real man and offer those sufferings and sacrifice to the Lord for your wives, for your children? And I want to tell you something. When you pray like that, miracles happen. Children convert. Wives begin to actually love you. And they actually want to have intercourse with you. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. All right, all right. All right. <laughs> Father Louis Boyer, the Catholic convert, he said the cross stands at the end of any path a Christian may take. Even if the resurrection is that which attracts him, it is an unavoidable fact that sooner or later he cannot escape the necessity of giving up everything, himself, his loves, his possessions. Sooner or later, we all have to do this. But we need to remember it is Christianity alone that brings meaning to the cross. You will lose everything. I will lose everything. So let's start losing everything by turning our sufferings into sacrifice today. Jesus wants to glorify you. God wants to share his glory with you. He does not want you to be some weak little man who can't do anything, accomplish anything great. He wants to accomplish his glory and his greatness through you. That's what God wants to do with you. He wants to make you a real man. And St. James tells us, I call it the, the four Ps, there's going to be pain in your life. And that pain leads to patience. And patience in the Greek comes from the Greek word hupomene, which means to remain under the trial, not to flee. And that patience leads to perseverance, fortitude, manly courage. And that perseverance leads to perfection. That's what God wants to achieve in you. He wants to make you a perfect son so that you can be a great father. And you know what Jesus thinks glory is? Talk about a paradox. In John chapter 3, 8, and 12, he says, When the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. And the Greek word for lifted up is hypsao. And hypsao can mean to be lifted up in exaltation, in glorification, but it can also mean to be lifted up in crucifixion, in execution. And Jesus uses the word hypsao interchangeably to mean both. And so what's the message? He's saying that my execution is my glorification. My crucifixion is my exaltation. And it's the same for you. Your crucifixion, whatever cross you're enduring in your life right now, is your path to glory. God wants to exalt you through this, and he wants to make you a shining example. So that when the world looks to you, they are so attracted to God that they want to give their lives to him. St. Paul tells us in Romans 12, verse 1, he says, Offer your bodies as a holy and living sacrifice unto the Lord. This is your spiritual worship. What's your spiritual worship? Going to the sacred liturgy? Well, yeah. But what happens when you go to the sacred liturgy? You receive the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the sacrificial Son, so that you can become a son of sacrifice. So that your sacrifices now have meaning because without being united to the sacrificial son, your sacrifices have no merit. They have no worth. That's one of the reasons why we go to Mass. Yes, to worship the Lord, but to be empowered by the Son of God to become sacrificial sons. It reminds me of the joke of the two guys, they're hiking through a jungle. And uh, one of the guys, he gets bit in the butt by a poisonous snake. And so he says, I got bit by a poisonous snake. You've got to go get a doctor. So he runs one mile. He calls out to the village. Is there a doctor? No one. Two miles. Calls out. Is there a doctor? No one. Gets to another village. Three miles. Doctor? No one. Finally, after five miles, he gets to this village. He cries out, doctor. A doctor emerges from one of the huts. He says, yes, can I help you? He says, my friend, he's bitten by a poisonous snake. Snake. I think he's going to die. He says, do you have a knife? Yeah, I got a knife. He says, make an incision like an X. Suck the venom out. Spit it out so you don't die and he'll probably live. So he sprints back one mile, two miles, three miles, four miles, five miles, and he gets to his friend, and he's huffing and he's puffing. His friend says, well, did you find a doctor? He says, yeah. He says, what'd you say? What'd he say to you? You're gonna die. 
that guy did not understand Jesus' vision of sacrificial responsibility, okay? But St. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, he tells us it's not only your privilege to believe and to know Jesus Christ, it is your privilege to suffer with him. And that's glorification. And my friends, this is fatherly authority. If you really want to have true authority, if you really truly want people to respect you, if you really truly want people to follow you, you've got to lead by sacrifice. You've got to set the pace of self-giving love. You go first. Imagine yourself in a war-torn country where there's gunfire constantly in the street. There's sporadic bombings. And you can't even leave the home to supply for your family. And so you're hunkered down, and your family begins to starve. And yet, on the horizon is a celestial city where the sun never fades. There's fruit on the vine, and there's peace in the streets. And you know you need to get your family there, but there's one problem. Between you and your war-torn country and that celestial city is a bramble-filled, thorn-thicketed forest that cannot be circumvented, that cannot be flown over. The only way is to carve a path through it, which would demand a man of his life. And so one night in desperation, you steal away with your family and you sneak away and you trek to the forest and you get to the edge of this forest knowing that your family has to carve a path through it. And you turn to your wife and you say those noble, heroic words that every woman longs to hear. Honey, you go first. <laughs> we laugh, don't we? And why do we laugh? Because we know that's not real. We know deep down in our souls that we're called to carve the path through this valley of death. And that's what we're living in right now, folks. A valley of death. And if you don't feel the bite and the sting of death, then you're not living for the Lord. If you don't feel the devil attacking you, then something's wrong. But you know what? We've been abdicating this authority of sacrificial responsibility since the beginning. Right? Adam. Right? Remember when Adam fell from grace? What happened? God approaches Adam and says, where are you? Now, God was not concerned with Adam's geographical location. God is omniscient, all-knowing. He knew that Adam was naked, hiding behind that bush. So why was God saying, where are you, Adam? Because God was trying to awaken Adam to the fact that he faulted at his spiritual location, his post. His post to defend the bride, to defend the garden. And you know what his role was? God gave him several commands. He said that you are called to till and keep the garden. And in the Hebrew, those words, till and keep, are avad and shamar, to literally cherish and protect, which means there's an enemy. And not only that, he has, he's called to cherish and protect the garden, but in Hebrew literature, garden is a symbol of woman. You are a garden enclosed, a fountain sealed, my sister, my bride, that's the Song of Songs. So the garden isn't only a place, but the symbol of woman, her, her interiority, her dignity, her fruitfulness the domestic life. And Adam was in charge of that. And then God gives him another command. You shouldn't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because if you do, you will die. Death is there. You must protect your garden. You must protect your wife. You must protect the children that I'm going to give you, or you will die. That's why God asked where... And, and interestingly enough, did you notice that God did not ask the one who sinned first? The woman? But he asked the one who was given the authority first, the man. Because where was Eve when God gave all those commands? She was just a twinkle in Adam's rib. I mean, you know, in her eye. <laughs> yeah, that's stupid. Okay, anyway. <laughs> but the point is, is that Adam was given sacrificial responsibility, authority. Authority, And that's what each and every one of us are given by God. And God is asking each and every one of us today, where are you? Where are you? Are you assuming your post of responsibility, sacrificial responsibility? Are you laying down your, your life in little ways for those who have been entrusted to your authority? But there's even more to this. And I'm going to go deep on you just for a little bit. And I just ask you to hang with me. There's more to Adam's role than just guarding a plot of land. There's more to Adam's role than just guarding a woman. 
when God created Adam and Eve, he said, let us make man in our image and likeness. Notice the divine we, us, our, a hint of the Trinity. The Catholic Catechism tells us that God is an eternal exchange of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we are destined to share in this exchange. God is intersubjective love. Three divine persons, so self-giving, they are essentially one in essence. They're in essence one. So get this, in the Trinity, there are three attributes. There's distinction, distinct persons, Father, Son, Spirit. There's unity. They live in the unity of the Holy Spirit. They're literally in one another. They're giving themselves to one another for all eternity. And from that unity is life, love, bliss, rapture, ecstasy, creativity, power. And that's fruitfulness. Distinction, unity, fruitfulness. Okay, and you're like, okay, that's really neat. So what's that have to do with us? Well, when God says, let us make man in our image and likeness, what is the image and likeness? Distinction. He doesn't make Adam and Steve. It's not homo. It's not same. He makes Adam and Eve. Complementary. Sexual complementarity that leads to communion, that leads to unity. And when that one flesh union occurs, there is life, spiritual, that bonds the two. But not only that, physical life that we call a baby, a third. And that image is a trinity fruitfulness. And we might be like, okay, that's really neat. What's that got to do with me as a man? I want to challenge you to listen to what I'm about to say right now. And if you get this, this will change your worldview forever. What I'm about to give you is the antidote to every moral sexual heresy that will allow you to be able to stand, understand why our culture is crazy and insane and is going to hell in a handbasket. You test the Trinitarian image of distinction, unity, and fruitfulness, which he wants to convey and communicate and have us live and reflect in our lives, and you weigh that against any sexual moral heresy. Let's begin with masturbation. Distinction? Not really, because you can't tell if the person's distinct because there is an opposite sex there. So it fails at being distinct, it fails at unity, it fails at fruitfulness, and rather being a sign that points us to the eternal reality of the self-giving love of the Trinity, it points to hell. It's an anti-sign. Pornography. There might technically be distinction if, if it's like hetero, but there's no unity and there's no fruitfulness. This is an anti-sign that points the world to hell. Homosexual uh, unions. No distinction. Same, definitely no fruitfulness, no unity. It's not intercourse. It's going one way, not two ways. There's no intersection. So there's no distinction, no unity, no fruitfulness. This is an anti-sign of the Trinity. Contraception. And this one hits us all right in the groin. Because if we believe the stats, 90% of Catholics use contraception. And we wonder why God isn't rebuilding his church. We wonder why we're spiritually dead. This is a big reason, because you might have distinction, sexual complementarity between the male and female, but you don't have real unity because they're holding back their procreative powers. They're not giving themselves fully to one another. And you definitely don't have fruitfulness. Abortion. Distinction, yes. Unity, yes. But then we kill the fruit. We murder the baby. No fruitfulness. No fault divorce. There once was distinction. There once was unity. There once was fruitfulness. But then that unity is destroyed not only in the marriage, but in the family. In vitro fertilization, surrogate mothers. There's no distinction. There's no unity. There is fruitfulness. And look at this. You can weigh everything against these three attributes. Look at transgenderism. The person actually is cutting off or maligning their distinction. They're no longer binary one or the other. We don't even know what they are. And rather than being made in God's image and likeness, they're making themselves in their own image and likeness. And let the truth be told, it's just a surface change. It's not metaphysical. It's not ontological. And they can't procreate. And therefore, there is really no distinction. There is no unity. And there is no fruitfulness. This is the antidote to every moral heresy. If we begin to live like a trinity and understand that and proclaim it, this is the answer to our world. And this, my friends, 
is why you're essential, as Adam was. Because Adam was called to be a guardian of that mystery of the Trinity's self-giving love in his family. And so are you. So am I. But God is asking each and every one of us, where are you? And if we believe the stats, are we among the 75% of men who are taken out by pornography? Boys trapped in men's bodies. Are we distracted by our hobbies and our works and all these temporal affairs that we don't pray to God daily? Remember, one-third of devoted Catholic men pray daily. That's almost nothing. If you avoid daily prayer, you might as well just be avoiding any power, spiritual power in your life. It's like, like years ago, I had a backup drive installed on my computer. And... Uh, all the software, everything, by the technician. And I noticed after a week it wasn't backing up my data. So I called the technician, he ran me through a series of resolutions. Nothing was working. And so finally he says, hey, David, check to see if the power cord's plugged in. And I'm like, of course it's plugged in. He's like, just check. Sure enough, it wasn't plugged in. Shame on me, right? But as good as that backup drive was, it was powerless because it wasn't plugged into the power source. And you and I, if we're not plugged into the power source, which is God, by the power cord, which is prayer. As great and talented, as good-looking as all of you guys are, you're not going to achieve anything. In fact, you might be spinning mud all over the place. Now, if you have any doubt about what I'm saying, that this is Satan's agenda to malign and redefine the Trinitarian image in marriage and family, let me share with you a quote from Kate Millett. Kate Millett was one of the foundresses of NOW, the new organization of women that rose up in the late 1960s, a radical feminist organization. And this is how she would begin all of her rallies with the following chant. Why are we here today? To create a revolution. What kind of a revolution? The cultural revolution. That's neo-Marxism. How do we create the cultural revolution? By destroying the American family, the icon of the Trinity the perpetual reminder of God's self-giving love on earth. How do we destroy the American family? By destroying the American patriarch. That's you and me, the pater familias, the father of the family. How do we destroy the American patriarch? By destroying monogamy, his marriage. How, we, how do we destroy monogamy? By pornography, sexual infidelity, eroticism, homosexuality, and divorce. Welcome to the world we live in. And where was the gun aimed? And where is the gun aimed? At you. The patriarch. The American father. The devil hates your guts because you have all the power in the world to change the world. And you have got a target on your back and he wants to take you out. Sexual sin is not like just some casual hobby. It is invented by Satan to incapacitate you, to hollow you out, to render you useless in God's plan. But we are guardians of the mystery of the Trinity in the family. But most of us are like Jason Bourne. How many of you guys watched or read the novel Jason Bourne? Huh? Okay. Well, Jason Bourne, it opens up. Jason Bourne is floating unconscious in the Mediterranean Sea with two gunshot wounds in his back. He's saved by Italian fishermen. And when he awakes... He's suffering from extreme memory loss. Then he undergoes a series of assassination attempts. And he doesn't understand why he's being hunted. Who's hunting him? Because he's forgotten something essential. He's forgotten his identity. He's forgotten his mission. And I really believe that a lot of us fathers were like Jason Bourne. We have this moral amnesia. We've forgotten who we really are, our identity, and our mission. Our mission is fathers. Your identity, your identity, who you are as a father leads to your destiny. Your identity leads to your destiny. Who you are determines who you will become. St. Catherine of Siena said, become who you are. Become who you really are and you will set this world ablaze. Don't doubt that. Don't doubt that. The devil is in your head right now telling you to doubt that. That's a lie. Become who you are. Become who you really are. You will set the world ablaze, even if you think you're the most boring person in the world. 
God has created you in his image and likeness to be a father that leads this world to God the Father. Your identification leads to your destination, which is glorification, which is deification. God wants to make us partakers in the divine nature, as St. Peter tells us. He wants to deify us. But you know the path from your identification to your destination, which is glorification? You know what that path is? Your vocation. Your vocation is a father. And that word vocation, it comes from the Latin word vox, which means voice. God's voice is calling us on the path of fatherhood. And as one confessor told me after I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, he said, you will be a saint by means of your vocation, not outside of it. So, we need to be a threat to Satan and his kingdom. We need to relive and reflect God's fatherhood in our lives so that the world sees God's fatherhood. So I'm going to give you a couple tips on how we can practically live this out, but I've written extensively on this. So there are a ton of books over there that you can dig into that will fill out, you know, that basically pat out Joseph, St. Joseph's spirituality, okay? But here's just a couple tips. The first thing is if you're to be an icon of God the Father, we are called to be the voice of the Father that our children cannot hear. We are called to be the face of the Father that our children cannot see. We are called to be the touch of the Father that our children cannot feel. So when you speak, do you know that your voice is prophetic? A father's voice is prophetic. He can almost determine the trajectory of his children's lives. You tell a child that he's going to be a good-for-nothing, that child will believe he's a good-for-nothing and most likely become a good-for-nothing. You tell your child that he's made for greatness and for glory, and that child every day of his life will want to aspire to glory, aspire to greatness. A friend of mine, his father told him he was worthless, lazy, a good-for-nothing, and this guy was a talented carpenter, mechanic. He's been in and outside state pens five times cooking up meth, dealing, you name it. Because he believed the lie of his father. We can change that by speaking words of encouragement, by t telling our kids little anecdotal stories from our life, giving them life's most valuable lessons, but we need to be the voice of the father that our children cannot hear. You need to proclaim God's word in your home. If you can't preach, if you can't teach, just read the gospel to your kids every night. But you need to be the voice of the Father that your children cannot hear. The second is, look upon your child. Be the face of the Father that your children cannot see. When they're talking to you, especially those little ones, don't just be like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, stop, look, and listen, and give them the dignity that they are owed. Because you will teach them that they're valuable. You will teach them that they're chosen. You will teach them that they're delighted in. And when you teach them that, that's what they believe about God. My daughter, Zelly, she's 15 years old. She told me, Dad, you know what my favorite moments in life are? When we drive to Menards together. You guys know what Menards is? <laughs> okay, all right, all right, okay. I was speaking out east, and they're like, Menards? All right. But can you believe that? We just get in a car, we're talking about life, and we're shopping for stuff for projects. And she says that's the best time of her life because she's got the face of her father exclusively to her. I believe in daughter dates. I've got five daughters. I'm surrounded by women. It's an, I'm, I, I'm estrogen poisoning. I'm guilty of it. Yeah. <laughs> but I take my daughters out on daughter dates weekly. I take my wife on a date night every week, and it's consistent. And I got to tell you guys, this has changed my marriage. Because you know when, when Eve saw Adam, the first thing that Eve saw, get this, the first thing that Eve saw wasn't some wilderness, some paradise. She saw a man going, whoa, you are amazing. That's what Eve saw. She was right there. And that's what a wise want us to see. And that's why I love date night. Because I can look across the table at my wife, look her in the eyes, and assure her that she's the most beautiful woman in my world. And that's what we're supposed to do with our kids. Take your sons out camping, hiking, splitting wood. Get in that project with them. But don't do as one guy told me. His dad, you know, they were working on a plumbing project when he was very young. And he was trying, his dad said, move the wrench like that. And he was having a hard time. And his dad took the wrench and said, just let me do it. And now, at the age of 35, he doesn't believe he can do anything. That's the father's power negatively. The father's power positively is, a friend of mine, destroyed his relationship with his firstborn son, domineering, shoving religion down his throat. His son became a carpenter, excellent, 
Son got in a need, got in a pinch with a job. Actually called his dad for help. The dad showed up, good friend of mine. And you know what he did? They're working, and this takes guts. He said, son, will you forgive me? I was just a kid raising a kid. I didn't know how to be a father. And that changed the relationship forever. Now they go to daily mass together. They work on projects together. It's just beautiful. But that's the power of a father. I want to tell you guys something. There's a huge difference. And if you get one thing out of this talk, I hope you get this. There's a huge difference between accepting someone and choosing someone. You know, we can accept our children. You know, we can accept our wives. And they can live in our homes. And we can just pass by them and everything's fine. They're sponging off of us. They're eating the food. They're not paying rent. They're existing. You know, they're accept we're accepting them, right? But then we can choose them. They're sitting at a dinner table by themselves. We can go sit down and sit across from them and talk with them. You see your child struggling. There's something going on. You penetrate that experience and find out, was there a breakup? Were they rejected by their friends? You've got to choose your children, not just accept them. Can you imagine if you get to heaven and Jesus welcomes you and says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. All that I have is yours. You know, the remotes are on the table, Netflix, Amazon Prime's on demand, beers in the fridge, cupboards are stocked with snacks. At the end of the golden hallway is your room. Pillows are like clouds because they are clouds. You're going to love it. And he says, But wait, Peter, James, and John and I, we're going to the little Irish pub to get some spirits, and don't wait up for us. What would you say? Wait a minute. I want to be chosen. I want to be the desired son. I want to go with. I want to be included. And that's how our children feel. That's how our wives feel. They want to be a part of the mission. They want to be a part of the plan. They want to be chosen and not just accepted. And this is reality for me. Many years ago, my third daughter, Anna Marie, was born at 28 weeks premature. She was small. Her leg was the size of my finger. And I don't have big hands. All right? You see me, I'm a pretty small guy. She spent a month in a neonatal intensive care unit. They got her lungs functioning, her digestive system fun functioning. She came home after a month, our little Anna Marie. Within five days, she spiked a fever. She had trouble breathing. So we took her back to the hospital, but we couldn't readmit her to the neonatal intensive care unit where they were specialists. We had to admit her to the pediatric unit. And they weren't equipped to take care of a baby that small. And so, Anna Marie, she was diagnosed with RSV. It's a cold that attacks premature infants' lungs. And in the process, there was nurse neglect. She suffered 10 hours of apnea, started having seizures. And then by the time the life support team came in, got her manual life support, and they got her on the medevac helicopter rolling across the tarmac. By the time she got to that children's hospital two hours away, she suffered permanent brain injury, three clinical death experiences, literally from that point on trapped in her body. Not ever able to walk. She can talk, barely. But she can't do anything for herself. And literally, when they were rolling her across the tarmac, the head nurse said to my wife, myself, and my parents, this is our fault. We will rectify this. They never do that. And my wife's sister, who was married to a multimillionaire at the time, offered to pay for the lawsuit against the hospital. And you know, the more that I thought about filing that lawsuit against the hospital, the more I subject, uh, yeah, subjectively or subconsciously distanced myself from my daughter, Anna Marie. That's not the daughter I was supposed to have. They stole my daughter from me. And I began to slip into this depression and this spiritual darkness and resentment and bitterness. And finally, in a moment of desperation, I took it to prayer and asked God, I'm like, God, just save me from this depression. Save me from this spiritual darkness. And the words came in, forgive them. I was like, forgive who? Forgive the nurses and the doctors. It's like, no way. No way. They stole my baby from me. And then I continued to spiral into this anger and resentment, spiritual darkness. And so, and in another moment of desperation, I called the head nurse, that woman who'd said that to us. I explained who I was. And I said, I release you of your debt. I forgive you. And it was from that moment on that I began to not just accept Anna Marie as my daughter, but to choose her. And Anna Marie has become the anchor in our home. She has taught me lessons about self-giving love and sacrifice that no homily, that no, no spiritual book could ever teach. She's a saint. Her cross is her wheelchair. 
She is literally stuck in that thing. But see, what Anna Marie has taught me is that not only do you choose your children, but you need to bear their burdens and your wife's burdens as your own. St. Paul says, count others as better than yourselves. That's true humility. And bear their burdens as your own. So this is what we need to do. We need to bear their burdens as our own. And think, I mean, like, another story about Anna Marie, but she was in fifth grade, and she was coming off the school bus, and she was sobbing uncontrollably. And we're trying to get the bottom of it. She has trouble talking and communicating, and evidently some knucklehead at school made fun of her, telling her that she would never walk. And Anna Marie has brain injury, so that was the first time in her life that it actually dawned on her that she would never walk. And so she was sobbing uncontrollably, all the, time, all the way from the time she got home from off the bus to dinner and even through dinner. And so finally, I got her out of her wheelchair and I carried her into her bedroom and I sat her on my lap and I was rocking her and she's crying. And at one point, her eyes open up and she catches sight of the crucifix on the wall. And then a, a smile gradually comes across her face. And I mean like, I know my daughter's got brain injury, but I'm like, what's going on here, you know? I'm like, Anna Marie, why are you smiling? And get this, a mentally damaged child said, I get to suffer with Jesus, and that makes me happy. <laughs> she bears the cross, and it was almost like she was inviting me. She's saying, won't you be my Simon? Won't you help me carry this cross? Won't you bear my burdens as your own? And in doing that, what happened is, I started bearing her burdens as my own, and my wife saw that, and she wanted to participate. And then my kids saw that, and they wanted to participate. And pretty soon, we have this dance of self-giving love in our family. And a lot of times, we don't argue about who has to change the diaper. Oh, it's your turn, not my turn. No, we have to argue and say, you're not changing the diaper, because everybody wants to change it to help out. And that doesn't happen always, but that's what Anna Marie and self-giving love and bearing others' burdens can do for us in our lives. Lastly, we need to be the touch of God the Father that our children cannot feel. It's so important that our children get hugs and kisses and pats on the back. Even sons to, or fathers of sons, hug your sons. Validate them. Because you know what psychologists and psychiatrists say? That if children do not receive physical affection at early age, they become warped with their sexual desires. Welcome to the world we live in. When our daughters don't receive our affection, they go looking for that affection from guys we don't approve of. We need to be physical in the proper way. And one of the greatest ways to be the touch of God the Father that your children cannot feel is through the blessing, the fatherly blessing. You have authority in your home to bless your wife, your children, because those are the people that God has given you. You have authority over them to bless them. And St. Joseph, in, in, in Jewish homes, preceding the Sabbath, the father would summon his family and bless each of his children. If it's good enough for Jesus and Joseph, it's good enough for my family. And so every night, I summon my children. I don't have to summon them anymore. They beg for it. But I summon them to me, and I simply trace the cross over their foreheads. And I ask God's fa May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine kindly upon you. Lord, bless this child. Bless this wife of mine. Grant her every favor and every blessing of highest heaven. Protect her from all evil and bring her to eternal life in you. Amen. And my daughters, my wife, they crave it. And my wife's a lot taller than me. I gotta, you know, I gotta reach up there. It's kind of humiliating, you know? But I got the authority, you know? But what's beautiful is in that moment, you become the voice, you become the face, you become the touch of the Father simultaneously. And guys, I just gave a retreat up north to a whole bunch of guys, and I talked about blessing your wife, and here's the deal. If you don't bless your wives, if you don't bless your children, guess what you do? You leave a void. And you know what the devil does with a void? He loves voids. You know what Jesus says about that? When the house is swept clean, that demon goes, and he finds seven other demons to fill that void. you got to fill that void with something, and that's a fatherly blessing. That's your ownership, in a sense, spiritual ownership. Say, I claim this house for God. I claim my wife, my children, for God. 
And in that moment, you become the face, the voice, the touch. You reflect and reveal God, and you fill that void. But you know, I don't understand women, and it is awkward to bless our wives. You know, I, I really don't understand women. And, and just a little side note, there's a, a kid who came home from school, and he said, Dad, can you believe in other countries men don't know their wives until they get married? He said, son, that happens in every country. <laughs> So we, I may not understand women, but I know the one thing that every woman deep down really wants. And every woman deep down really wants the sacrificial love of the new Adam, Jesus Christ. And when she doesn't get that, she does what Eve does. She seduces, she manipulates, she coerces to try to get them to eat the forbidden fruit so she can get some kind of disordered affirmation. But deep down, underneath those spandex, Underneath that halter top, underneath that half-dressed woman, you know what she really wants? A man who sacrifices. Bless your wives. Be the priest of your family. Be the provider of your family. Be the protector of your family. And guys, like Dan said, I think, there's a lot of guys in here who are cramming for the final exam. Okay, you old folks. <laughs> I'm in your group now. But guys, it is never, ever, 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 ever too late. And you will never look bigger to your children, especially if you've effed up your relationship with your children and your wives. You will never look bigger than when you come clean and you say, not I'm sorry, because when you say I'm sorry, you hold all the control. You're still saying what you feel, what's going on in your life, you narcissistic jerk. But when you say, will you forgive me? You are placing your heart in their hands and they can wring it out, stomp on it, or they can kiss it and give it back to you. And I guarantee when you say, will you forgive me for that 1% that I did wrong when you did the 99%, just kidding, we do the 99%. <laughs> will you forgive me? You will never look bigger in any of your children's <laughs> eyes. You don't have to go off on some religious monologue. You don't have to teach them theology because it's right there. You are the prodigal father. You are searching the horizon for your child. You are longing for them to come home to you, to your embrace. Why? Because deep down in your heart, you want them to come home to the father's embrace. That's the goal of your life. And if there's any other goal, it's wrong. We are prodigal fathers. But you know something, and this is the key, we are wounded sons. A lot of you guys got gaping holes in your souls. And you've lost your love and your trust in God the Father because of the lies of the devil. And he's convinced you that God the Father does not desire you, has not chosen you, does not delight in you, and that is a lie. God created you for himself. All things were created in him, through him, and for him. You were made for him, and he loves you, and he thought the idea of you was so great that he willed you into existence. And he wants to do something great in you. But guess what? To be dependable fathers, you've got to be dependent sons. To be trustworthy fathers, you've got to be trustworthy or trusting sons. You have to trust God the Father, and when you do, your life will change, and everything hinges on this. The father must take the lowest place. I'm going to end with this little story. Anna Marie, my special needs daughter, she was three years old. And we were invited to a birthday party. A friend of mine, it was his daughter's one-year birthday. Anna Marie can't sit up, she can't crawl, she can't walk, nothing. I have to hold her up to sit her up, or else she'll fall over. Or at this birthday party, I've got her in between my legs so she can sit up Indian style without tipping over. She's cross-eyed because of her mental brain injury. My friend calls his daughter, Michaela, over to open up the gifts. Michaela, come on over with the gifts. So she starts crawling. Then she sits up. And then she gets up and she does this Frankenstein-like walk over to the gifts. And everybody's clapping, smiling, because this was the first time Michaela walked. And I'm clapping and I'm smiling on the outside, but on the inside, I'm grieving. I'm dying because I'm comparing that one-year-old to my three-year-old daughter who's trapped inside of her body. And being a stout-hearted German, I was like, you're going to learn to crawl. So that night, I laid her two feet in front of me, 
got on the floor with her. I said, Anna Marie, call Papa. No reaction. Come on, you can do it, Anna Marie. You can do it. No reaction. So I said, come on, all you have to do is start by lifting up your head. And she kind of tried to lift up her head and it flopped down. And that's when the wheels started spinning. Will she ever be able to draw? Will she ever be able to crawl? Will she ever swing on a swing? Will she ever ride a bike? Will she ever go to prom? Will she have a boyfriend? Will she ever get married? And I was internally fearing. And I got down on the ground beside her, and I was frustrated, and I started moving her arms and moving her legs, and I said, see, Anna Marie, this is how you do it. This is how you crawl. But it was useless. And I realized it was useless. And I put my face in my hands, and a thought came to me. I said, Devin, do you see how much you love your daughter, Anna Marie, that you want her to crawl so much that you get down beside her? But I, your father, love you and Anna Marie, all my children, so much that I only, not only come down beside you, but I come, or come down beside you, I come inside of you. Not only so that you will spiritually crawl or walk or run, but so that you can soar with me and experience my glory. God the Father, through his Son, took the lowest place. And what happens when you're at the lowest place? You can lift up everything above you. And that's what God, through Jesus Christ, has done, has taken the lowest of the low and raised them to heaven in each and every one of us. And that's the Heavenly Father's duty and goal and sacrificial responsibility, is to take the lowest place by initiating self-sacrificial, self-giving love and raising the people around him to heaven. And that, my friends, is how we will be glorified. Go home and be like St. Joseph, a father on earth, like a father in heaven. Glory be to you, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.